people like me have been pushing for a long time from the theory side, saying there's no reason to believe that black holes can form in only one way, which is stellar remnants, that there ought to be multiple pathways. And similarly, there could be many kind of different environments that we have not considered where galaxies could form. Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with theoretical astrophysicist and cosmologist Priya Natarajan. Welcome, Priya. It's great to see you. I'm delighted to be on Closer to Truth and to be talking to you, Robert. Great. Well, let's start with the breathtaking discoveries of the James Webb Space Telescope and their implications for cosmology. Uh, just what's been your favorite JWST discoveries? What has excited you the most? Well, um, uh, since I had a bit of a stake in that discovery, my favorite discovery is that of these galaxies that are hosting uh, supermassive black holes already in place when the universe was about 450 million years or so. And in particular, this one galaxy called UHZ1. And uh, that it's just been astounding, uh, entirely uh, unexpected sort of uh, well, would have liked to have seen something like this, but I never realized that the universe might actually hand it to us, gift us so quickly. So it's a supermassive black hole that is so um, in place so early on in the universe. And the host galaxy, we were able to measure some very key properties for that growing black hole and the host galaxy that um, really sort of confirm and provide very compelling evidence to the idea that you can make black hole seeds multiple ways, and that this particular source likely came from a heavy seed that formed from direct collapse of gas in the very early universe. Wow. And so your most exciting discovery is really the biggest surprise as well. Yes. And, and the fact that, you know, we had sort of made predictions of this kind of this class of objects, which likely formed from direct collapse uh, seeds, uh, heavy seeds that start out. So these are black holes that have a head start in their life and probably start their life already 10,000 times the mass of the sun at birth. Mm. And so they don't have to grow a whole lot, which, mm -hmm. you know, kind of explains the timing, the fact that you can see them so early on. Uh, but then if it formed from direct collapse, because you can get no information from the black hole itself about how it formed, it's the environment that telegraphs that information. So it's the properties of the host galaxy. So this was a very specific scenario that was predicted. And there were five properties that such a source had to satisfy. Primarily, it had to be detected both in JWST and by the Chandra Space um, X-ray uh, Telescope, also in space. Uh -huh. and, and so this is one of the few sources, few accreting growing black holes at that early epoch that has actually been detected in X-rays as well, which, you know, sort of incontrovertible evidence that it's a growing black hole, essentially, because otherwise there's a little bit of issue when you see light with the James Webb Space Telescope, whether the light is coming from star formation or from, you know, gas that is being accreted on by a rapidly growing black hole. So you don't know what portion of the light is coming from which of these two processes. But if you see it in the X-ray, it's the hottest gas. And that is the gas that you get from accretion onto the black hole. And, so and it was 400 million, just 400 million years after. 450. Yeah, 450. 450 to 470. Yeah. So that's really, really early. Not the earliest, but it's really early. It's so far back, though. Are, are you able to get the re resolution? Because that, that's what surprised me, that you could have the resolution to be able to make those determinations. You said five different uh, um, uh, kinds of data that can articulate together. Yeah, so I think that's where my, you know, my two kind of... Um, deep interests in astrophysics collided and gave us, as I said, this gift. So I think we were able to see the source, which would have been too faint to see um, had it not been amplified by one of nature's own telescopes. These are uh, gravitational lenses. So this is a source that is sitting behind one of the most powerful 
uh, uh, cluster lenses known in the universe. And what was sweet for me is that this is a lens that I have actually modeled in my studies of dark matter. And so to have found this object behind that, you know, wow. Wow. was uh, very sweet. Okay, well, we're, we're going to be discussing all of these things in, in great detail, dark matter, black holes, gravitational lensing. But let me first give a proper bio so that everyone knows a little bit more about your background. Uh, Priya Natarajan is a theoretical uh, astrophysicist and cosmologist in the departments of astronomy and physics at Yale. And her work probes dark matter and dark energy, particularly using gravitational lensing, which we'll just mention, but we'll be discussing in depth. And uh, her work describes the assembly and growth of black holes. The example she just gave uh, brought all of this together, as she said. She's also the author of the critically acclaimed book, Mapping the Heavens, the Radical Scientific Ideas that Reveal the Cosmos. So let's uh, let's get back to the uh, early universe. And um, one, one thing I'd like to uh, put before us is uh, there has developed because of the early galaxies, the early black holes, earlier than expected, more structure than, than expected. There's been a what I call a, a cottage industry uh, that has grown up about a Big Bang skeptics or deniers who would use this data to deny the standard model of cosmology, denying the lambda cold dark matter model, and even say that contemporary cosmology has blown up because of, of the data. How, how do you respond? And I'm sure you've seen a lot of that. Oh, yes, I've seen a lot of this sort of fanfare. And um, let me say very clearly <laughs> that the standard model has not blown up. <laughs> Nothing. Um, the what James Webb and other observations so far are showing us is that there are many details in this model that remain to be understood well. This model otherwise stands pretty intact. There is no evidence that suggests that we have to look at an alternative to the Big Bang or the Lambda cosmology, uh, Lambda CDM model at the moment. There are some tensions, but these tensions often in scientific theories, and we know this from history, often point to refinements that are needed in a theory. And we know that such refinements are needed because our understanding of the very complicated interplay between dark matter and baryons, the processes that are implicated in galaxy formation is still quite scant. Um, we have a pretty good sketch of how um, galaxy formation proceeds, and we are able to make predictions, enough to be able to make predictions and confront them directly with observational data. But there are lots of details that either we do not understand the physics of, or even if we understand the physics, we don't have the capacity to model them in simulations because they couple, there are many physical processes that are coupled across scales temporal and spatial, not all of which are tractable in a single simulation. Hmm. So, you know, so there are all these gaps. There <laughs> are known, well understood gaps in our knowledge and we are trying to fill them. And, and I think every time we confront an observational data set that kind of um, is in tension, then it's telling us something more. There's information there and it's telling us something more about what we might be missing. Of course, there's a possibility when you find anomalies or mismatches that, you know, it could be pointing the way to some brand new theory, but nothing, no tension has quite risen to that level yet, except possibly the measurements of the Hubble uh, parameter. Right. Well, that, that's that's a different uh, issue. The, the Hubble tension. We can talk about that later. That, yeah, that's a very different matter that is not pertinent uh, specifically to the to early either dark matter or black holes. Right. But 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 just basically, simply, the argument is that th discovering so many larger, earlier galaxies with more structure, more much more numerous than expected, a, an order of magnitude maybe more. Um, that uh, how, how do you explain that? I mean, what, what is the best current thinking of how you can get so many larger early 
uh, structured galaxies far earlier than expected? So my own view is that there is there are two possible things that are going on here. One is that you know we have calibrated all our models for the efficiency of star formation and therefore galaxy formation to near the nearby universe. There is no reason to anticipate that the efficiency of these physical processes does not change with time. So the early universe is really you know full of gas right it's a very gassy early universe and therefore it's quite possible that you know the efficiency of you know sort of these oh. detailed processes that convert the gas cool it clump it make it denser and produce stars could be quite different there's no reason to believe it has to be the same in the nearby universe and the distant universe and our models, we don't have any sort of a priori motivation to put that in as an ingredient. But JWST is suggesting that we ought to think about that possibility. Now, now that does not mean a change in the laws of physics, which some no. have speculated. What yeah. it means is that the laws of physics are operating differently because of the different density levels. Yeah, so it's not that the laws are operating. The laws are operating as they are. The efficiency of the processes is different. We have the same law, but the efficiency of conversion of gas into stars. And that, and that relates to the density at that time. I mean, that, that's the significant difference. Right. Uh, it, could, it could be a function of the density. It could be a function of the temperature of the gas. These are all possibilities that we have not considered in great detail. And we've not been able to build models from the late universe uh, by construction, because this is not the case in the late universe. And the other possibility um, that I believe um, could be uh, happening uh, in terms of why we are finding so many more galaxies and black holes is that, you know, we have been fixated on particular modalities, specific modalities for star formation and black hole formation. And people like me have been pushing for a long time from the theory side, saying there's no reason to believe that black holes can form in only one way, which is stellar remnants, that there ought to be multiple pathways. And similarly, there could be many kind of different environments that we have not considered where galaxies could form. So one kind of environment that I have pushed um, is that, you know, quasars, these uh, growing, actively growing black holes in the very early universe can launch very large jets. We see those jets. We right. see them in the mid uh, mid distant universe and in the nearby universe, like very large scale jets that uh, have a lot of energy, they could push gas. And so you could have shells of gas that are pushed by these outflows that could also cool and collapse and form stars and maybe form little galaxies or star clusters. So wow. this is just an example. You know, we've not looked at all these possible environments, right? Where you could form collapse structures that are visible with stars. So I think, you know, I don't buy the argument that there's something fundamentally wrong with our models or that the laws are different. I just think that the processes, the astrophysics that we are calibrating with the nearby universe data, uh, there's no reason to believe that they have to be at the same efficiency or operate in exactly the same way. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.